The Opposition National Democratic Congress is challenging claims by the Electoral Commission that the Ayawasu West Wogong by election was peaceful and successful. That's the position of the General Secretary of the party, Sedwin Ketia, at Wednesday's IPAC meeting. The NDC boycotted last Thursday's polls over violent, violent clashes that left many injured. Sedwin Ketia, John Singh Sedwin Ketia, insists the violence disrupted the process and wants the EC to be candid about it. The commission sought to present a picture that the by-elections were very successful, very peaceful, and so on. And so this uh, commentary did not uh, find favor with majority of the parties present. And we're wondering what their criteria is in calling an election successful or peaceful. And, and so those were the issues around which the debate uh, uh, arose. In spite of all that, they said the election was peaceful. And so that is why the commission, that is why the political parties felt that, look, you cannot call this election peaceful. And the explanation that uh, none of their uh, polling stations officials were attacked is, to say the least, a very lame explanation. You cannot say that when there is, uh, there is violence that intimidated people, uh, about 16 people were injured uh, and they are in hospital, and these are all election related. And you are in charge of an election. And you come to report to the nation that the election was peaceful. I, 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 I don't get it because none of your staff uh, was attacked and the, the voting process was not disrupted. So that makes the election peaceful. It is, it is not any explanation that should you sit where we feel. Like we disputed the fact that this claim of Ayawa Soba election being peaceful and the basis for the commission uh, arriving at that conclusion is wrongful and it should not be entertained at all anywhere because it will ridicule the commission itself. If any election management body can call this Ayawasu West Wogong election as peaceful, then they don't know what they're about. General Secretary of the New Patriotic Party, John Buedu, is however disputing the assertions. We don't come to High Park for Electoral Commission to be detailing polling station to polling station. These people were beaten here, these people were beaten there, and all that. We were all at Akwitia. Just seven polling stations. Then the NDC gas president, uh, Mama, said they were masters at unleashing violence. And we all saw it. When we came back to uh, High Park, the uh, Electoral Commissioner or Commissioners giving their report, they don't take us through. They even witnesses directly. People who don't vote in police stations were voting with abandon, <laughs> with, 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 with even confidence. You understand? They beat people up, they maim people. We came back to IPAC and nobody discussed anything. We just discussed it, the result. And for me, for me, the NDC for me, says yes. that most political parties disagreed and actually fumed who, at the Electoral who, Commission for who, concluding which, that which the was, election was peaceful. Which, 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 which are the most political parties talking about? And you think, I mean, that's not, that's not that accurate? That is not accurate. They were, accurate? please, please, did they also tell you that when they raised the flag that the Electoral Commission had bloated the register, it was sorted out with them and they agreed that the, the, the thinking they had was wrong? Did they tell you mm. and consider that they didn't say that uh, the Electoral Register was, was bloated? Did they tell you? Mm. Did they? They so said they, so it. They were being selective with the they were, That's how they are. And I'm saying on authority that Bidzidin said that they did not ever say that the Electoral Commission bloated the register. The Electoral Commission believed that 137 police says nobody was prevented from voting. Nobody was, well, the Electoral Officers were allowed to do their duty without snatching. Because they were not part of it, they reduced their participation. They, nobody snatched any ballot box. So, so is it your, you understand? Your position Wait, that, I'm that, saying that because mm, they were not there, nobody yeah, snatched no, ballot box. Mm. So, so nobody showing, changed ballot box. So you are there was the no. That the election was peaceful. Was peaceful. But it wasn't peaceful, it was what? No, I'm so the election was peaceful. Was it peaceful? It is, really. For the NPP? Not for the NPP. Mm. For people in Ayawaso West Wogong. Oh. Meanwhile, the Electoral Commission has been asking the political parties to address the vigilante menace. Here is the uh, director 
of Communications at the EC Kofi uh, Jack Basu. We do not have uh, that. But let's move on. An election observer group, Godeo, has described as misrepresentation some comments by the Electoral Commission of the group's report on the Ayawasu West Wugon by election violence. Godeo's report captured instances of violence during the by election. But the EC issued a press statement rejecting portions of the report. At a news conference Wednesday, National Coordinator of Kodeo, Albert Ahing, said its assessment was fair to the facts on the ground. Albert Ahing says Kodeo does not see itself in an adversarial relationship with the EC, but working together for the common good. Kodeo's observation efforts are aimed at complementing the efforts of the EC in ensuring electoral credibility. In discharging this responsibility, Kodio has always endeavored to work cooperatively and in good faith with the Electoral Commission, as Kodio sees itself not as standing in an adversarial relationship with the EC, but as working ultimately toward a common end of ensuring transparent, credible, and peaceful elections and election management in Ghana. Well, a pressure group Occupy Ghana has condemned the brutalities that occurred during the Ayawasu West Wogomba election. The group, however, has five questions for the National Security Minister on the deployment of armed men to the election grounds. And I'm going to share that with you uh, right now. Occupy Ghana, and with one of the questions is, uh, the first question is, as a legal basis of you assembled, maintained, the circumstances under which the Ghana Police Service facilitated the act of that force by supplying vehicles or other logistics for the operations of that day. Three, the reason and necessity for maintaining the said force outside the leg legally and constitutionally recognized services established by law. Four, the procedure for recruiting persons into the said force. And five, the financial provision made for maintaining this force. And the statement goes on, we demand answers to these questions because the powers of government as required by law must be exercised first in the welfare of the people who were inexcusably violated by this force and second in the manner and within the limits laid down in the constitution. This letter is a formal request for information under Article 21 of the constitution. Further, it constitutes statutory notice of our intention to take appropriate action against the government should you fail to respond to and address the issues we have raised. Well, following closely on that statement, the government has established a three-member commission of inquiry into the violence that marred last Thursday's by election in the Ayawasu West Wogon constituency in Accra. Former Shrash Commissioner Francis Emil Short will chair the commission. The statement issued and signed by Director of Communications at the Presidency, Eugene Ahing, reads... The acting president of the Republic, Vice President Al Haji Dr. Muhammad Dubamia, has, with the consent of the president, Nana Dodankwe Kufado, set up a commission of inquiry into the event of violence which occurred during the by election held in the Ayawasu, Ayawasu West Wogon constituency on January 31, 2019. The commission is composed of Mr. Justice Emil Short, Chairperson, Mrs. Henrietta Mensa Bonsu, member, Mr. Patrick K. Echampong, member. Uh, Mr. Kofi, Ernest Kofi Abochi, former Dean of Faculty of Law, Gimpa, and private legal practitioner, has been appointed as Secretary to the Commission. The terms of reference are as follows. A, to make full, faithful, and impartial inquiry into the circumstances of and establish the facts leading to the events and associated with the violence during the Yawasu West Wugomba elections on January 31, 2019. To identify any person responsible for or who has been involved in the events associated uh, with violence and injuries. So which the commission considers in causes of the events and the associated violence and injuries. To submit within one month its report to the president, giving readings for its findings and recommendations, including... You're watching Joy News Prime, we're taking a break, but we have more coming up. Don't go away.
We're returning to our earlier story on the establishment of a three-member commission of inquiry into the violence that marred last Thursday's by election in the Ayawasu, West Wogong constituency in Accra. Now, the former Shrash Commissioner, Francis M. Short, will chair the commission. The statement uh, was issued and signed by Director of Communications at the Presidency, Eugene Ahi. And the commission actually has a month within which to complete its work. But already there are persons who believe that the commission may not be necessary. One of them is lawyer John Indebogreen. And they have been, they, they can easily be identified. So I don't see the, the need of a commission of inquiry. With the greatest respect, that is my humble view. The IGP yesterday issued a statement in fact saying that they're expanding the criminal investigations into this matter and, and told us for the first time who and who is part of that probe in terms of the committee. And I asked that same question of your president just before you came on. Which of these two bodies would you give uh, precedence in terms of looking into this matter? The IGP's criminal probe or this one? I will give precedence to the, uh, the IGP's probe. I, I don't want to call the IGP's uh, a, a decision uh, or what he intends to do a probe. <laughs> a probe? No, an investigation. Straightforward investigation. People have committed crime. So they should be apprehended, invest, granted bail, investigations will go through, and they will be charged and prosecuted. That is the end of it. I am, so, uh, I mean, and, and w the president of the republic has established a commission of inquiry. The IGP, an appointee of the president of the republic, is also carrying out some investigation. What is the meaning of that? I mean, I think that uh, we, with the greatest respect, uh, this question of uh, commission of inquiry, in my, my very humble view, is a non-starter. Anti-corruption agency, Economic and Organized Crime Office, Yoko, says people should ignore a video circulating on social media aimed at damaging its executive director and staff. In a statement signed by Jacqueline, about Republic Affairs Director of the Office, the, it described the video as malicious and slanderous. It reads the attention of the Economic and Organized Crime Office has been drawn to a video circulating on social media to the effect that Nam one uh, brother mentions top names of top officials who took money phones from Nana Pia, authored by one KOD. The video is malicious and slanderous with the main aim of destroying the image of the office and reputation of the executive director. The supposed brother KOD of Nana Pia has no basis for his allegations, which should state clearly that the statement is totally false. It continues that the executive director, Mr. K.K. Amwa, nor any member of staff of Yoko, has in no time received cash of any denomination, nor mobile phones, nor 4x4x4 land cruisers from Nana Pia. The office is of the opinion that the freezing of the assets of Men's Gold Company Limited and its associated companies has incurred the displeasure of some beneficiaries of Men's Gold Company Limited, which may have prompted circulation of the video. The video and its alleged content will not deter the office from retrieving and preserving the assets owned by Men's Gold and its associated companies. And this is signed by Jacqueline Avotri, Head of Public Affairs. Uh, the economic and organized crime. Uh, Member of Parliament for Tamil Nadu, Alassane Saibu Suyene, was on Wednesday ordered to leave the floor of Parliament by First Deputy Speaker Joseph Ose Uwusu. According to correspondent Joseph Opuku Gapo, the MP was disrupting proceedings of the House after the majority had moved an application insisting that the minority apologize to the Ayawasu West Wogon MP Lekli Alassane for describing her as quote unquote bloody widow on Tuesday during her swearing-in. The Member of Parliament for Tamale Central, Alhassan Tsuyini, Tamale North, Alhassan Tsuyini, walked out amid shouts from the minority. Honorable Member for Tamale North, Honorable Member, can you leave the House? Honorable Member for Tamale North, can you leave the House? Please, my challenge, show that he leaves the House. Yes. I 
support that in order to bring this matter to a close. We would just apologize and let go. It doesn't appear to me that that is the path the minority leadership agrees to. They want the individual members who were holding the placards with the description, with the description, bloody widow. In that circumstance, in that circumstance, I will revise my order. But I will hear the major, uh, majority, the uh, minority deputy, deputy man, my, uh, minority leader. And then I'll be, revise my order. Honorable member for Tamale North. Honorable McCann, can you leave the house? Honorable member for Tamale North, can you leave the house? Please, my challenge, so that he leave the house. Yes. Earlier, the first deputy speaker of parliament, Jose Wusu, had ruled that MPs who describe the newly elected Ayawasu West Wugong MP as a bloody widow will be identified and referred to the Privileges Committee. This was after the minority MPs refused to apologize for their action. Now, you recall the MPs held placards on Tuesday with a bloody widow inscription during their boycott of the swearing-in of the MP. The minority MPs have justified their actions, saying Lydia Hassan benefited from the bloody by-election. But the majority says the action was uncalled for. First Deputy Speaker says the Privileges Committee will determine the matter. Properly speaking, I should have just picked out those who were holding the placard and referred them to the appropriate committee. I was trying to bring the matter back quietly by asking the leadership to apologize. Now the leadership says they did not hold it, and they are right. None of them were holding it. So what I'll do is I'll ask the, the clerks to get the tapes of the proceedings of yesterday, and then the specific individuals who were seen holding those placards will be dealt with specially. Across the divide, people heckled. At some point, he mentioned some people's names, including the Asin Central MP, and asked him to conduct himself well. Why didn't he ask him to walk out? So why Suhini? Why is it that when he mentioned me, his only directive was for me to walk out? So he acted unfairly to us, you think? You think he's the, he did you some injustice, you say? I mean, it is obvious on the face of what has happened that he treated others differently from me. And, and, and as you walked out, you were shouting in his direction. Um, why are you seeking to tell him? I wasn't actually shouting in his direction. I was telling everybody who could see that I am ready to pay the ultimate price for fairness and for objectivity. People have died for that. They have laid down their lives for that. So asking me to walk out is no punishment, in my view. Maybe I believe the speaker got too emotional, in my view. I may be wrong, but I thought the speaker got too emotional. I thought you could have drawn our attention. That, look, a member is doing this. Can you then we'll try? If that fails, then you say, walk him out. But I, I, I wish it never happened. I will, take, I will talk to my colleague. If I were the, sitting in the chair, I wouldn't do that. I would rather try to caution because once Peter sits sitting in his chair and he mentions your name, it's, of, it's like telling you that, look, you are getting on my nerves. We've seen Dua Dao, Speaker Dua Dao, even standing up just to tell the other, look, you are getting on my nerves. He could have been more lenient with, with, with our colleague, especially he being a, a, a member of parliament. It is part of our rules, what the Speaker had done as part of our rules, in order that law and order may be maintained. And if on your own you get up and you speak, the way you want, that is 
unparliamentary. And that's why the Speaker worked him out. And I think the Speaker did the right thing. Well, the majority women caucus in Parliament has also described as blasphemous, frivolous and barbaric the inscriptions on the minority MPs placards. At a news conference earlier, Deputy Majority Leader Sarah Ajasafu urged the majority to minority to render an unqualified apology to the MP elect. The women caucus in Parliament expressed utmost revulsion and disgust to the shameful stance staged by the minority yesterday. Indeed, we are converging the, con the sentiments and anger of our constituents across the country. We state that their action is a vicious attack on the strain strenuous efforts made over the years as a people to attain gender parity and empower women. The Constitution of the Republic of Ghana frowns on the discrimination against women. And in Article 12, Clause 2 of the 1992 Constitution, every person in Ghana, whatever his race, place of origin, political opinion, color, religion, creed, and our, uh, the emphasis here is ours, or gender, or gender, shall be entitled to the fundamental human rights and freedoms of the individual contained in Chapter 5, but subject to the respective rights and freedom of others and for the public interest. That is Article 12.2 of the Constitution. We, the women of the majority caucus, are grossly disappointed in the attitude and language of the minority members against Honorable Lydia Seriam Al Hassan on the various placards displayed in the chamber yesterday. We hereby condemn in no uncertain terms the act of the minority, a rather disrespectful and inhumane treatment, and an attack on the dignity and integrity of womanhood. This is brutal and unparliamentary. Order 93.2 of our standing order states, it shall be out of order to use offensive, abusive, insulting, blasphemous, or unbecoming words, or to impute improper motive to any member or to make personal allusions. We are absolutely concerned, convinced, that the language on the placards was grossly unparliamentary, frivolous, barbaric and unconstitutional. Mwala Yawasu West Wogong MP Lydia, Lydia Sarah Malassan says she is forgiving the minority for describing her as a bloody widow. I am here this afternoon in my capacity as an MP. It is my first duty to come through here and visit the injured. He is responding to treatment and um, I regret the incident. I regret it and I'm happy there's a committee in place to investigate. I urge the police to work hard and get to the bottom of this. They should work without fear and favor. This is a simple democratic exercise. Uh, we shouldn't have gone to this extent. What happened yesterday is unfortunate. Um, they started this from day one. And I'm surprised, especially the ladies in parliament, who wants more ladies to join leadership will do this. I have forgiven each and every one who, I don't know what their interest is, but I'll say that I've forgiven them. The Ayawasu West Wugong MP was at the 37 military hospital where she went to visit some of the injured who are still on admission there. And she also paid their hospital bills after realizing that they owed the hospital. We're taking a break here. Now, with 245 Ayalulu buses grounded, commuters who once patronized the bus rapid transit service 
are now having to rely on the regular minibuses that transport passengers around the city. The BRT system Join News has found out in the Grounded Wheels investigative series by Manasse Azuria Wune has been out of service for some time now due to operational challenges. Join News is Emmanuel Juvenu, who has been observing the transportation challenges confronting commuters as a result of the service disruption reports. Persons living with disabilities are especially affected as they cannot easily access the minibuses because they are physically challenged. The struggle to get into Trotro along the Amasamai Accra Highway can be tough. Many times, to be guaranteed a seat, you have to be athletic. It's for this reason that the Ayalolo Bus Rapid Transit System was inaugurated in 2016 to provide decent and time-bound transport services to commuters in Accra. Unfortunately, 59 buses deployed in the Greater Accra region have all been grounded. Passengers along the Amasamai of Angkor Achimota to Accra routes now have to struggle for Trotro. Shereen Donyo is visually impaired. She relied on the Ayalolo bus to work each day when it was operational. In the bus were special seats reserved for persons with disability to prevent jostling with boarding. Training the Ayalolo was so convenient because when you are visually impaired or any disabled, there is a special seat reserved for you. And you know, Ayalolo has this uh, way of reducing the steps when you want to join. So when joining it, you don't have problem. You know the step is always low. And when you want to ally to, they reduce the step to your level. You don't have any problem. And when you sit, no one come and push you off from your seat and whatever. But on days she's on low cash, her sister would have to hustle for a seat and then give up the seat for her to board. Patrons of the Ayalolo service recount the convenience of commuting to the central business district and now want government to work hard. I use the Ayalolo bus. I usually use it from Achimota over here to Accra, their bus stop, because I work at the ministries. And bordering it helps me a lot. It, it enables me to get to my office early, on time. I'm complaining that he has money on the card, but because the bus is no more in operation, He's not going to use it and he doesn't know how to even get the money back from the card. So actually it's going to affect people, those who normally pick the Ayayol bus you know, from work and from work to back home. And now we have to opt for the normal trotro and it's not convenient because with the Ayayol, sometimes you already had money on your card. You just wait for the bus at the bus stop, it gets there, you bought it and that's it. But now it's and you with that you could avoid the traffic because there was a separate route for it so you didn't go have to go through the normal traffic but now you have to you know go using the stress and the structure is not convenient at all operators of the ayalolo buses the greater accra passenger transport executive say cost of running the service outstrips revenue and inadequate routes are reasons they stopped operations the achimota bus terminal is a pale shadow of itself and now home to the homeless. The metal chairs at the station are rusting away. Some patrons are unhappy and want government to resolve the challenges immediately. For, for me, I think the Ayalolo should be, I don't know for what reason it's not in operation now, it's not in operation now but I think it should be brought back. I don't know why they are packed and it's a waste of national resources, I should say, because money has been invested into, invested into it and then it's been packed and it's not in operation. Even as at now, I haven't heard any news about the main reason why they have stopped work just they just stop just like that so we are begging the government <coughs> to let the Yarolo buses come back again to help us especially we the workers just before leaving the Achimota bus terminal I saw three buses exiting the yard when I inquired where the buses were headed some workers told me off camera that some private organizations, including churches, occasionally hire the buses. Ayalolo Inga means we keep going, but unfortunately, 
Ayalolo has stalled. Until these buses resume operations, patrons of the service, including sharing, would have to endure the discomfort of using Trotro. Also, the 742 million Ghana CD loan spent on the service would go waste. The taxpayer would have to bear the burden of payment. In another development, Maslow CEO Stephen Amwa has justified why government paid $13 million, being the cost of some 350 vehicles purchased under the Eswa Mahama administration at an inflated cost. Chairperson of the National Development Planning Commission, Professor Stephen Adair, Tuesday expressed his appointment in government for, pay, for the payment of $13 million, being the full cost of the vehicles to Mark Ghana. Let's listen to him. There's no doubt at all that there is something not right with this contract and uh, we hope that it will be unraveled and those who have caused financial loss if there is any to the state will be made to pay for it the state cannot just dispense with these monies and uh, have it discounted no somebody must be held accountable uh, what will be the best course of action for you well i don't think that uh, Anybody, not me, anybody will do this in their own private company. And at this moment, I think that the least that can be done is for the Ministry of Finance to revoke the conditional uh, tax waiver because it was not approved by Parliament, ask Mark to pay it. But I will still want somebody to pursue the fact why it was 20000 per bus extra somebody knowingly caused financial loss to the country. And I think that somebody must be held accountable. But I'm quite surprised because uh, I'm not a lawyer, but if a contract is clearly, as it appears, tainted with corruption, with about uh, the price about 20,000 inflated. Per bus. Yes, I'm quite surprised that it's being paid at its face value. And the negotiation didn't make any difference. That's quite so surprising. It sounds to me too fishy. And it's not only part being fishy in the past, but too fishy now. <laughs> By speaking to joining us after the investigative report was aired on Tuesday, Maslow CEO Stephen Amai explained the decision to pay the car company was because the Attorney General advised them to do so. If anybody had interest in terms of monetary or financial, why would you go ahead and even allow the issue to go to court? Two, we're not so stupid. Does the professor mean that if a company, two companies signs a contract, one to purchase number of items from the other, agreed on a figure and signed, and then the management of the company that is supposed to purchase those items hand over the company to another management, and the contract is binding, the new management is not supposed to pay. Is that what, the, is that what my professor is telling me as a young man, please. I don't think it's everybody that is in politics that is interested in corruption. And it's unfair to say that a government that is claiming to protect government pays. It's very unfortunate. There was me, I'm not a legal practitioner. But this is the note from Attorney General's outfit that the contract was valid and that we should go ahead and pay. It's here. Read it. Maslock entered into a valid contract with the two companies involved. The companies have delivered the vehicles and Maslock has taken possession of same. Maslock has failed and stroke or refused to make payments to the companies involved in accordance with the provisions of the contract signed. Taking custody of the cars was done by the NDC regime, my predecessor. Signing the contract that is binding us today as a government to avoid any so-called judgment debt. That the same people would think we plan to do judgment debt and there was something fishy. Was done by the NDC government, not us. So what are they talking about? There are genuine people in this country that want to help 
sacrifice everything they have for Ghana. And none of these people are praised. It's not everybody that is in politics that is corrupt. I'm not saying I'm perfect. But the fact of the matter is that the NDC, that under their regime, they have increased one bus by about $30,000. This huge amount is not an issue to be given the profound attention that we need as a people. Rather, somebody that a contract is binding his government or organization that there could be judgment that the buses could have gone so bad or rotten, and then the same cost could have been quadrupled. After when, taking when this, or, uh, making this decision, picking the right alternative to mitigate the cost that we might have incurred as a government, our praise is that those who have increased, inflated these figures by $30,000 each is not an issue. Please. I want to tell my professor again that there is nothing fishy. They signed a valid contract. The bone of contention was about the price of the cars. For one good year, we were renegotiating with the suppliers. Because they don't care. At least they have sold to you at a price that you have signed that you're going to pay them. You perform your part of the obligation. They have supplied the cars. What have we done? For one year, they even reduced. In fact, I'll bring the documents to you. And for others to say that NDC government signed a contract, but they didn't pay, we have come to pay. I can tell them the finance minister then had signed and given orders that they should pay about 37 million out of over 60 million amount, total amount. On the faith, the actual contract was signed on the faith. If they care to know, please, people should look for the right pieces of information, the right data, and avoid making arbitrary decisions and they're introducing arbitrariness in the components of their information they're giving out. I shall that's it for the bulletin. I'm Israel. Bye. Thank you very much for watching. You have a good night. Joy News Prime.